Hey everybody, how are you doing? My name is Dr. Daniel Choi. I'm Dr. Ku. And we are here from North Texas Dental Surgery. And so we wanted to answer um, some of the questions and comments that we get on the YouTube channel. Today, we're gonna keep it strictly related to dental implants. So let's jump right into it. So Dorothy Walters 9059 says, how many teeth are on each bridge of an all on four or three on six? So what are your thoughts? So to um, give a simple answer, it'll be 12 to 14 teeth. Okay. But we know most of the time it's just about 12 teeth, right? Yes. Because we're trying to get first molar occlusion. So let's go into why, like people will be like, well, we even have wisdom teeth. Well, obviously most people will get their wisdom teeth out, mm -hmm. but they're like, well, why don't I get a second molar? Well, 90% of your chewing is actually happening in your first molar and the two premolars in front of it. Yes. So that's usually good enough for chewing. So most people just notice that. But mm -hmm. the other issue is not so much related to that. It's actually your mouth is a hinge. So the further that you go back towards your molars, you can't open as wide. And so therefore, there's less space back there for you to create for the prosthesis, the actual teeth. And so um, that's just why, you know, you know, not, you know, it, it's just very difficult to create the space without like removing an excessive amount of bone back there. Yes. And also you have sinuses and your sinuses are basically air filled cavities. And so, you know, it's very difficult a lot of times to be able to place the implant to be supported, to, to be sorting, a, uh, to be supporting a second molar back there when there's very lim limited prosthetic space and jaw opening space. And also you have that big air cavity. So a lot of times it just becomes a really difficult, you know, proposal to be able to, yeah. you know, be able to offer second molars back there. And if you can't get a second molar back there, then why would you put one on the lower, right? Okay. Because it wouldn't be, you know, opposing anything. And you're only going to get chewing if you're opposing a lower tooth. So. Yes. You know, um, but you know, we do so many all on four. Some patients do occasionally ask, it's like, hey, you know, why can't I get a second molar? It's like, it's, there's, there's, you know, everything is a cost benefit analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So risk reward. And just trying to go back there and maybe even doing pterygoid implants or sinus lifting and, you know, making sure that you have enough bone reduction to get, create the prosthetic space. Otherwise, if it's too thin, then your teeth may break. Even if you have a zirconia prosthesis, there's a lot of factors that come into play, and that's why ideally, again, we get to first molar occlusion. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, some patients may be very adamant about having the second molar tooth. I've seen it. And yeah. um, so ideally, we want to be able to place what's called pterygoid implants all the way in the back. But sometimes pterygoid implants may not work out. In that case, if a patient is really, you know, uh, set on getting the second molar, then we may have to consider zygomatic implants. But then I think that's an overkill in my opinion. There's just, just a lot like, of, yeah. yeah, there's just, you know, again, everything is a cost benefit analysis, risk reward. And so that discussion has to be had in regards to, it's, it's yeah. not that simple in going ahead and like adding a second molar. And if we do, how excessively cantilevered is going to be? Or do we have to look at pterygoid, sinus lifting, or mm -hmm. zygomatic implants? Yeah. And so people need to understand also, and we need to create another video talking about pterygoid implants, zygomatic implants, all these like, or sinus lifting, and what are the, the downfalls of these, some of these solutions. Obviously there's more invasiveness, more cost, but in the event that something does go wrong, what happens as a result of that, right? Mm -hmm. And just, are we going to go through all that just to add another second molar? Yeah. Right, exactly. And so like in my mouth, I wouldn't do it, yeah. right? So, okay, so the next question is, all right, this was related to the dental tourism video that we had. And she said, user BS7 says, well, actually, I don't know if it's a he or she, there's a dog in the <laughs> image there, but it says, uh, you have a point, just wonder why international medical tourism is a problem, but interstate tourism is okay. Well, I mean, like I said, um, you know, when I was talking about that video, I mean, if something happens suddenly, now you have to book a flight to Turkey yeah. or Thailand. I mean, that, that's a massive flight. And honestly, like that's like massive expense too, right? And so to do this right, there, you're required to make at least three trips. And one of my things that I was trying to like point out in that video is that I think a lot of people are trying to, honestly, and this is what pisses me off about the whole dental industry or medical industry or like whatever, is just like, I think a lot of companies tell people what they want to hear. Yeah. And the whole goal of our you know, videos is to tell patients and set expectations you know, I think a minimum number of trips is three trips, you know, your initial surgery and then your follow up at like about the five month mark and getting new impressions and getting everything set and then going through trial teeth, making sure those teeth are OK and then having a third visit to get your final teeth. You know, in my opinion, that's the least amount of appointments. Now, I've seen companies throughout the U.S. or, you know, medical tourism and they tell people, hey, one visit. And so what do they do? They try to get people their teeth that same week, right? Yeah. We see a lot of marketing 
um, from, you know, centers saying, hey, you know, you're going to get your final set of teeth this week. And then as a result of that, what do they do? They offer you zirconia that, that first week. Some people will then offer you nanoceramics, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what they'll do in like, you know, to fit the fix the difference later on with all the resorption, the bone and gum shrinkage is they'll, they'll line the nanoceramic or, you know, like all these other different types of solutions. But I mean, my, my, all, like my other thing too, is like, again, going back to the medical tourism, I mean, like, you know, it's like, you know, why just, that's an insanely big flight that God forbid that you have to make a last minute, like, like, it's not like infections never happen. They're very rare, yeah. but they could happen. Like, and in the event, if that happens to you, are you going to book a last minute flight to Turkey? What's the added expense? What's going to happen as a result of that? And then if you have something like that, how many more visits are you going to have to make, right? So most of the time, everything works out perfectly. But, you know, in the event that something does go wrong, there is that to consider. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when you're going to a different state to get dental work done, yeah, you may, I mean, some people may encounter the same problem as, you know, they would if they were to go to like a different country. But at least, you know, if you're getting the work done in North America and if things could things don't go as uh, planned and you have some recourse yeah right you got your biggest... you got attorneys and you got double yeah. board i mean try try suing somebody in a different country <laughs> yeah and then like the court visits and court appointments and all that stuff i'm sure it's not an easy process who i have no I know nothing about it but yeah. i'm sure it's not an easy process mm -hmm. um okay let's go to the next question so mitchell wong with the exception of you which i already checked out the biggest problem is the outlandish unjustified cost in the usa then there are the unethical dentists who aren't even experienced enough to justify the cost they want to incur if i was going to pay the top astronomical costs that unqualified dentists want to charge why wouldn't I go to an orthodontist who specializes in implants? I think they meant oral surgeon or periodontist. Yeah. Orthodontists are the ones that straighten your teeth with braces. Um, instead, I have to go to a DDS that went to a seminar and now performs implants and even Botox. The dental industry greed is fully living up to its reputation. I have seen an interview where you basically left speechless trying to defend the unqualified others. You know, it's kind of interesting when it comes to costs because even in the last few years, um, I've seen costs like basically go up across the board. I mean, just, you know, you know, just finding the employees has always been a struggle. Finding qualified employees, um, definitely seen inflation in payroll. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> all our costs with all, all our costs with everything. Um, it, it just unfortunately everything's gone up so it's kind of interesting though because here in dallas we are one of the lower uh priced markets in america because of how competitive i don't know how but a lot of dental implant um when you talk to a lot of dental different dental implant um, companies and especially the ones that are involved a lot with all on four they will tell you that dallas fort worth is like the most competitive market out in, in america and then then denver after that but due to that excessive comp that, that competition, like you know that that brings our cost down, right? And so, um, it it's all supply and demand. Yeah. You know? If you're seeking care in an area where there's only one all-on-four provider, yeah, then you probably have to pay more. We've talked about this before. Like, I mean, yeah, you like you know somebody that uh, contacted us was quoted like one hundred twenty thousand, one hundred thirty thousand, something like that in Boston. Um, but like you know. You can find somebody that gets quoted, you know, goes a little rural in Texas. Mm. And because there's not that many providers out there, he ends up getting quoted like, you know, like $60,000, which is for his full mouth, which is way more than what we charge, mm. you know? And then we had that patient that came yesterday that was quoted uh, 45,000 just for, by the oral surgeon. Mm. And then another 15 25. grand or what? I think he said 25. 25, okay. Yeah. So yeah, he was quoted 70 something, he yeah. said total, right? Mm to get this done um, between his general dentist and his oral surgeon, which we will actually create content about because there are some centers that try to do all on four. We're having to jump between the surgeon's office and the general dentist's office. And then there's a lab that's usually involved too <laughs> that's doing most of the work. So um, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you will see some guys charging a lot. You're gonna see differences geographically and also kind of in regards to like, I mean, um, You'll see different qualifications. Um, you'll see centers that do a lot of this so they can lower their costs. So you, yeah, I mean, the whole purpose of these videos is like, you know, bringing as much information to you guys. You just really need to do research, you know? And so we're also gonna release some consultations that we've had with patients to just kind of let you know about what we, every patient, every patient is different, right? What's going on in their mouth, what they need. And so hopefully if you guys watch enough of these consultations, you'd have a good idea what may be going inside your mouth too or what to expect.
Um, someone says, Craig Meek says, I have six on one zirconias. I could not be happier. So he probably means I got all on six zirconia. So congratulations. That's great to hear. Um, Live Laugh Lakers says, I always tell patients lower dentures suck, but don't have any suction. It's a memorable punchline that gets a point across, um, which is true, right? Like lower dentures absolutely do suck. Every time you're talking or eating, your tongue moves and therefore the, the floor of the mouth with all the muscles and glands moves. And then therefore your denture wants to dislodge anytime you're talking or eating. You can put all the denture adhesive you want on it, but there's not much of a ridge of bone there for it to kind of sit on. So yeah, lower dentures really do suck. Um, I feel like in a perfect world, the all on four is ideal every time. In the real world, patients have bad home care, don't come to recalls or come back ever. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, I, I would agree with that. Like there's a lot of patients that um, it, it kind of like makes you want to pull out all my remaining hair, but like, you know, they do all on four. They gotta have good, you still have to like, you know, have good home care. You need to use your water pick. You still gotta brush your yeah. teeth. And they still need to come in for maintenance appointments at least once a year and you never see them again, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it makes me extremely frustrated. Um, I would agree with that. Um, but he also says, I will, all I would say is that overdentures are a very a viable option, in my opinion, because they allow for better self hygiene. They allow for people that can't afford four to six implants to do two implants on the bottom. Also, repair for overdentures can be done in office where zirconia has to be remilled or sent in for weeks at a time. Lastly, overdentures are less technically technique sensitive from the provider side. Not yours, of course, though technique, implant placement, ambulating, planning, etc. is always important. Really love your content, Doc. Keep posting. This is obviously a dentist. Um, thank you, uh, Live Laugh Lakers. We really appreciate the comment um, and love. Uh, it, it does. It definitely does seem like we do have a lot of doctors, dentists that um, watch our content. So we always appreciate uh, the comments and the views. Um, in regards to like, what are your thoughts in regards to like what he says about the overdenture? Um, yeah, I think overdentures can be a viable option. Uh, it'll be a massive upgrade for someone that you know, is used to wearing conventional dentures. Right. But if they want to be able to eat certain food like steak, uh, corn on the cob. Yeah, corn on the cob. Then, hands down, um, all on four is superior. Right. Something that's screwed in, right? Yeah. Permanent. Yep. And I, I totally agree with what he's saying. Um, and he says, like, in an ideal world, all on four, for sure, right? Um, if somebody does have financially limited or if they are coming again from complete dentures, then mm -hmm. I say, yeah, um, a snap-on denture would be good. Two implants is kind of hard because, um, you know, my whole take on this is that, you know, I did my first, um, you know, fixed uh, hybrid prosthesis back in 2009 with a snap-on denture back at that time, too. Um, I definitely pushed more snap-on dentures early in my career because I had the same thoughts, mm -hmm. right? Um, like it's cheaper, it's easy to clean. But in my experience, you know, owning a clinic all these years, I'm in my 14th year of practice. Um, I, I've seen lots of patients go from snap-on dentures to all on four. Um, never seen a patient that did that say that he was happier with a snap-on denture. But obviously finances come into play, right? They make decisions, like finances are always the elephant in the room. So um, I always tell patients like, you know, Complete dentures, your base level, you got your all on four, which is your top option, and you got your middle option, which is snap on denture. I tell people that if you can swing it, like I'm the type of guy that, like, I didn't make a dime, like, you know, till I was out of residency at 33, you know. So, um, I tell people I always try to be financially responsible. So, for me, that's always picking the middle solution. Um, I feel like there's a lot of decisions in my life where I picked that middle solution, and I regretted it, and then I had to shell out more money. Yeah. And I ended up spending more money going to the best option than had I just gone to it from the beginning. I've done that with beds. I've done that with everything, yeah. you know? Um, sometimes, a lot of times, like that middle solution is really good bang for your buck, right? And again, if we're talking about a patient like this, I think that that's basically what your expectations are. Again, what's your starting point, right? Yeah. Life is expectations. If you're coming from having your own natural teeth to going to a snap-on denture, you're, you're, not, you're probably not gonna be happy. But if you, again, you are like going from a, like a lower, snap, uh, lower complete denture to a snap on denture, then you're going to be happier. Yeah. Right. And then it's going to be at a more affordable price than you can do an all on four. Right. So thank you for your feedback though. Um, so James Allen says, I was quoted 43,000 for upper and lower, um, all on four zirconia. That's honestly probably about like, um, going rate in DFW. Right. I know in California, it's a little bit higher than that. But you could say that like in, in Dallas, you could, you know, find a upper and lower all on four zirconia for 21,000, 21.5 thousand in arch is what he's saying. Um, but you can head out like 30 minutes or an hour into the countryside a little bit, literally yeah. from Dallas and you'll get quoted $60,000, right? Yeah. You can get quoted $60,000 even here somewhere in DFW, 
You can get, you know, you can get quoted. Yeah. yeah, you can get quoted seventeen thousand in Arch here in DFW. Just be a little careful, right? That's the whole purpose of our videos. Um, really, like you know, like uh, not to toot our own horn and watch our content, but you know, just watch as much, you know, inf like get as much as information as you can, and then be prepared to ask questions um, so that you have a, a ideal outcome. Again, the whole purpose of our videos, all on four, is a fantastic solution, but. And people are making that solution because they're frustrated where where their natural teeth has got them, right? But what like, you know, veneers and crowns could be a great solution, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. that, that can buy you a lot of time, give you a beautiful aesthetic smile. But even veneers and crowns, if they are not done properly, they will turn into a damn nightmare five years from now, right? Maybe yeah. 10 years from now, whatever that time period is, you don't want that massive nightmare later on down the road, right? Same thing with all on four. Unfortunately, what happens is people get all on four. They get the prosthesis, meaning the teeth in their mouth. They see a huge change from where they were just literally, you know, a few hours before they had their procedure yeah. to when they're waking up and they have the beautiful teeth in their mouth. But you can't be enamored by the beautiful teeth, right? What is lurking behind your bone and gums? That could be a disaster in the waiting a year, two years, five years down the road, right? Mm -hmm. We had that video that we had with that patient five, six years ago that had all that all in four work done in Florida, pulled a fifty thousand dollar loan from it, and then now she's having issues again. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's to me, that's a disaster. Right? So you don't want to have an outcome like that where now you're going to be like, well, I pulled a loan to have this done in the first place. And as we've mentioned in other videos, this is not just taking out implants and placing new implants, and then it's as simple as it was on day one. That surgery now has become significantly harder. Now we're talking about zygomatic implants or you know pterygoids, sinus lifting, you know. GBR, you know, quad zygos, like these are all different types of things that are on this, like, you know, that I'm thinking if a patient has a failed all on four, yeah. right? Well, these are all way more uh, difficult procedures. And therefore, Any kind of revisions is more complicated. Right. Yeah. And so for even a surgeon to want to take on your case, number one, that's going to be, they're reluctant to take that case on, yeah. number one. And if they do, they're going to charge you a lot more, yeah. right? And so this patient in like particular, she just spent five G, 50 Gs, right? How much now is she going to have to pay for revision surgery? Right, probably a lot more than fifty. Right, so that's yeah. again, you know, education, education, education is key to making sure that you don't have an outcome like that. All right, so next question. Someone said I'm having their all on four done in less than three weeks. That's awesome. Congratulations. ANC two thousand two says excellent informative video. I am a recent all on four patient myself. A very happy one, I might add. I did a lot of research before I decided on the LM4. When researching, I came across an oral surgeon who cemented, well, probably placed, um, mini implants in place as if they were regular size implants. I would love to know how safe and effective and your colleagues find this procedure to be. If memory serves me, he placed 12 mini implants on top and 10 on the bottom. Thanks in advance. 12 and 10. Wow, that's bananas. Uh, what are your thoughts? Mini implants, um, in my opinion, I think it's a good option for like a snap-on denture type of work. But for um, like something fixated in the jaw, I'm not sure if it's, I don't know. I don't know much about it. Maybe you have more experience with I, mini implants. So I differ where I don't, I don't like mini implants, like mini implants at all. Yeah. Um, I like, uh, because they're one piece and like the ball at the top, yeah. you know, if that breaks off, then we're really screwed. Um, I've just seen so many mi failed mini implant cases that have come to our office, you know, like looking for help over like literally over you know 14 years of practice mm -hmm. i keep seeing mini implants come in and um and i've been seeing a trend recently i don't remember what the protocol was a lot of people like to create these implant protocols and it was like had mini implants and regular size implants which i had no idea why the heck they would mix them um but you would never mm -hmm. place a mini implant in my mouth they use a different grade of titanium they're all one single piece um i you know, people will use mini implants because they're trying to avoid placing a regular size implant. Typically, the reason is going to be because your bone's too thin, right? So, I mean, if your bone's too thin, then just do GBR. Just augment the bone and, you know, widen out your bone. Obviously, that's more technique sensitive, and that's probably why a lot of people don't want to do that procedure. I had a patient who um, came in recently. We actually made a video about her. Um, that she was one of the two patients. I think we released this video like a week ago. Um, but she had a bridge up front um, from like basically canine to canine 
and they used like three millimeter diameter implants on her because her bone was really thin. Mm -hmm. But you know what they should have done on her is just done guided bone regeneration, built out the ridge, thickened the bone, because too having too thin of bone is going to be one of the biggest reasons why your you know implants will fail in the long run, right? So you want adequate thickness of bone around your dental implants. So some people, in order to avoid that, um, they'll just place skinnier implants. So in this case, three millimeter implants. In this case, many implants are even skinnier, right? Yeah. And so on that patient, when we looked at her CT, we could see that the implant wasn't even in the bone. It was in the gums. So I was actually able to just pull the implant bridge out of her mouth, sadly. So, um, yeah, I mean, in my mouth, you're not, we're not, we're not talking about, I think many, uh, many implants are a joke in my personal opinion. I know shots fired. Some people are going to take offense to that, but yeah, I, yeah. I just would never mess with them. GTS performance. I've seen your videos on this procedure and looks graphic. I'll only need to prepare myself financially, emotionally before and I'm ready, but honestly, this is something I need. Um, someone responded, I'm 30, had this uh, done two years ago and it's really not that bad. I only had local anesthesia, had little to no pain during or after surgery. For me, the worst part was keeping my jaw open for hours <laughs> while the surgery was happening. Wow, I have never seen anybody, have you ever done a full mouth, like a, a full arch with no Under sedation? Under oral sedation. You have? Before. Okay. Yeah. God, somebody had no sedation? Yeah. That's crazy, you know? Um, but kudos to you. It's a tough patient. Tough yeah. Guy. You know, and everybody's like all on four procedure um, is different. You know, I was stressing in previous videos that I try to really minimize any sort of bone reduction. I, I try to go for the very minimal amount of reduction we need to basically, um, you know, basically hide the, the where the prosthesis meets your tissue, the transition zone. And, you know, I, I don't go crazy like people did back in the day. So I know some providers still do. They try to reduce the heck out of your bone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the less bone reduction, the less traumatic, less swelling. Um, and also it depends. Like some people need to get a lot of teeth extracted. Some people don't, Yeah. you know? So every case is different in regards to like trauma. So um, don't look at a video or whatever, or like hear what people say about one person's experience. I find it's like wisdom teeth. You know, some people will like, we can, you know, I'd say on the average case of wisdom teeth takes 10 minutes to remove the, someone's wisdom teeth. Some people, like it takes two minutes. Some people, it can take 30 minutes, right? Extremely challenging cases. So um, how swole, like swollen you are or sore you are after a procedure is really comes down to like how impacted your teeth are, right? So it's a case by case basis. Like I wouldn't use someone's experience to basically generalize what your experience is gonna be like. But yeah, I could see how keeping the mouth open for an extended period of time, like yeah, that's yeah. hard. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Um, next question here. So someone says when we were made a video about how multi unit abutments affect speech and bulk on all on four dental implants, not your business says, is it normal for the temporary ones to have all that extra material? I'm almost three weeks since the surgery and I can barely speak both up and lower, upper and lower have that pink extra material and the hole is pretty far from the teeth. Mm. So yeah, I mean, that's where you got to use your surgical guides. Yeah. To basically tell you where the teeth, your implants are going to be placed in the bone, try to place your implant in a better position. Also, the rotate. So here, here's to let people know what affects the the bulk on the tongue side, right? That that's this patient is going through. That's affecting their speech. Um, it it relies on three main factors. Basically, number one, how is your implant placed, right? So your location of implant in 3D space, that like the orientation, whether like how angled it is towards the outer like lip. Um, or the like the the tongue or like like the towards the right to the left that can have a huge position like uh, effect on your you know where your multi-unit abutment is going to be that's yeah. going to affect your you know bulk also it's going to be rotation of your implant yeah right because little nuances of how much your implant is rotated going. right is going to affect yeah. you know how your multi-unit abutment is going to go on yeah then also your multi-unit abutment pivots in different directions, right? So, and then also you, which degree abutment you choose. So there's so many different factors and that come into play. Too. Exactly, height. right? All these different factors come into play when we're trying to dictate which, you know, how much bulk is going to come into play, right? Mm -hmm. Bulk, in my opinion, for an all on four is going to be your number one complaint. Yeah. Right? For sure. And the only way that, in my opinion, having done like all on four over all these years, that is just experience. In my professional opinion, experience matters. So if you want to, and I, that's where another thing too, is like, you would agree with me. Like if you do more or aggressive bone reduction, you're losing your bearings to yeah. where that guide is telling you mm -hmm. where the cingulum, and this is all technical talk, um, but trying to be as close to the tooth to minimize, you know, your, your bulk and make it more of like a natural type of bridge. Mm -hmm. 
the more you do bone reduction, you're losing that reference point. Yeah. That's another reason why I hate doing excessive bone reduction. My goal is, I'm sure with yours, is basically try to reduce as much bulk as possible to yes. make it as natural as possible, mm -hmm. right? Trying to get it to as ideal like a FP1 type of solution as possible while you're gonna have an FP3, which is the fake gums, yeah. right? That's that's how like you know that's what my thought is. Yeah. But. So unfortunately, this patient may have to just you know, tolerate it for a few months until implants are fully fused to the bone. Yeah. And then try over. fudging around with different abutments, yeah. right? But the problem here is that, as we said, that that rotate the little changes in rotation of the timing of the implant. Mm -hmm. If that's that's already set at that point, you can't change it at that point, Correct. right? So ideally, you want to get it like hammered out at the beginning. Now you can always mess with it later on. But it's never as ideal as that first appointment. Yeah. yeah, that's this is like what we just talked about for the last few minutes. That is a huge key point that a lot of patients don't know about, right? That actually, honestly, like I don't even think a lot of doctors do know long for, like yeah. they really know sure. about. And I think who's really doesn't know about that are offices where you get the surgery done at one location. Oh yeah. And then you get it restored at another, because the surgeon never sees the awesome. finish. They never yeah. see the yeah. They never see the finished product. Yeah. Right? They never see your temporaries and like where the, your multi unit abutments are and like the, the prosthetic bulk. Yeah. And then also your finalized product, your dentist or the lab or whoever's going to change out the multi unit abutment, they're still not going to see how much, you know, le I mean, like basically they, they can gain to reduce some of that bulk. Yes. So you want somebody that's doing like everything's being done under one roof so that they can follow everything from beginning to end to basically master the final product in the end. Yeah. yeah. So, in, for example, like for us, you know, if we are unsure about certain multi unit development, the placement of them, then we can have our prosthodontist check it for us. Yeah. So we actually have our prosthodontist check yeah. right after we place the implant, and then we, you know, any question, we always want them to take a look. Yeah. All right. So this is a long one here. Um, someone says K Dub nine nine one eight. Please help. I have a few questions. How long does it take? Because I know they have to extract the bad teeth and wait for gums to heal. So for the first visit that you get the work done until the last, last visit that you had the work done, how long was it? I need like 10 molars replaced top and bottom. I crushed my nose and broke quite a few teeth in a bad car accident. And that was 15 years ago. I'm 40 today and I'm worried it gave me some sort of heart disease though. I'm relatively healthy and look fine. But looks can be deceiving. We all know that it could be just my anxiety to be honest. Today they gave me three options today at the dental office. Number one is go to the implant route. It'll probably take a year to get everything finished and cost 28,000. Number two, do implants on the top and partials on the bottom, 17,000. And number three, just get the bad teeth extracted and do partials because it's a lot more in my budget. And that for that, it's only 5,500 and they could extract the teeth in three weeks and have the partials in by Thanksgiving this year, 2024 and said, I can always upgrade to implants later when my money gets back up again. I don't have any dental insurance, so this could be all out of pocket and they've recommending proceed financial. Yeah, who we used to. I just don't know which to choose. I have good credit, so I could probably get approved for the implants, but that's another big bill. Every month I'm 40, recently single and depressed and I've always been the life of the party, bachelor living, Las Vegas, dating beautiful women. Yep, <laughs> I agree. That's where I met my wife. No, <laughs> but right now I'm depressed and down in the dumps. I wish I knew the right answer to your SMH. Okay, so um, KW, you're not alone. We could totally uh, empathize with you. Um, we see a lot of patients in your boat. Um, money is always going to be the elephant in the room. So it sounds like, yeah, we, we do have three options. Definitely implant route, but then they said $28,000. One of my thoughts that's already going through my head and they're not replacing all the teeth, right? Yeah. They're just replacing some of the teeth. So if you had like car accident related trauma, that sounds like a big deal, right? And we don't know what the status is of the other teeth. Yeah. Are those other teeth in phenomenal condition, right? Where we know that we never have to touch those. Um, then like, okay, maybe we can potentially keep the teeth and maybe that solution makes sense, yeah. right? The problem though, is that when you have teeth in really bad condition, like with infections and related to trauma, something like this, chances are without even looking at your x-rays that your bone's not in good condition, right? And so if your bone's not in pristine condition, which it never is after trauma like this, then how high does your lip go, right? Because if your lip is uh, goes high and we could see your gum architecture, the piece of gums between your teeth, then getting a really good ideal aesthetic outcome becomes nearly impossible if you have infection from trauma 15 years ago. So even if your lip doesn't go very high and you only see half your tooth, then you could do an implant type of solution because you don't have to reconstruct all that bone and gum, 
right? Mm -hmm. Reconstructing all that bone and gum is going to be very expensive. It's going to be very invasive. And you can even come to the best of us. We're never going to be able to make you look like you were 18 years old again. And so that's just something that you need to understand. We could probably help you a little bit more if you sent us photos and like a 3D scan or like a X-ray or something like that. That'll give us a better solution option. I mean, reference kind of like yeah. sh show us smiling photos. Yeah, send us an email. Uh, yeah. Contact at NorthTexasDentalSurgery.com. Yeah, and we'll give you a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't want you to waste your money because, you know, the other thing too is like, you know, you could do other options like a partial but I mean, we, I mean, and Hey, if finances are going to like limit you to that option, then it is what it is. Right. You just got to make do with that. And you know, a partial is better than nothing. Right. Yeah. Um, but what would get you like, um, one thing that I always want to take into account is that if you, if this is going to affect you, like what you were talking about in the last few sentences, and if this is going to affect your confidence, I, I have a hard time believing because I've seen some, you know, we've seen so many patients over a career that patients ever get their confidence back from a partial. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, how are we going to restore the, like we always, when we are seeing patients for consultations, that's one of the first questions we ask, like, what is your end objective? What brought you here? Is it to be able to chew again? Is it to smile? Most people, it's a combination of everything. Right. And yeah. so how are we going to address that? And that's why we're not going to really talk about a partial denture. If you're saying that you lack confidence when you smile, right? Yeah. Because we know that a partial is not really going to be able to get you there. Yeah. Right. Even with dentures, like complete dentures, for example, we can make them look pretty realistic or lifelike. But in terms of the function, you're not going to have full confidence. So I think we need to restore both the function and, and aesthetics to make sure that you have full confidence in yourself. Right, right. Alrighty. So, um, I mean, I, we know he's stressed out. He just left three comments on three different videos right there. So, yeah, hopefully you see this. Um, all right, so Yeshua. So I had implants, denture, four in one, top, bottom. I guess he's talking about long floor. They had to do bone graft and also told me that I grind and clench. Dentist said it didn't matter. It's been four years since the implants. I'm experiencing TMJ, which I never had before the implants, even when I had teeth. I've been getting really bad headaches, anxiety, wishing and hearing a beating sound inside my head. I guess that's his pulse. He's hearing that pounding. With a very hot sensation inside my head, and I've been getting neck and shoulder pain that I've never had before the implants. I constantly get a reading of my blood tests that my red and white blood cells are high. Last time I visited my dentist, he says, because I've been clenching and grinding so hard that you can see the metal of my dentures. If I'm grinding so hard, does that mean the implants are moving up and down and the bottom down? Uh, please answer my question. I need help. I've been unwell and I do have nerve damage, but I don't know if this was before or after my implants. They are titanium implants. So yes, you have titanium implants. And what you're also talking about is you're talking about, um, you can see the metal. So the titanium underneath the acrylic. So you have a hybrid all on four, right? So the titanium bar with a acrylic on top. So you're grinding so much that you're grinding your acrylic down. Um, so what are your thoughts? I have a thought in regards to he's experiencing TMJ and it's probably the issue with the prosthetic or the teeth part okay maybe not necessarily the implants mm -hmm. but the actual teeth part mm -hmm. my guess is that this person's either the teeth are maybe too long mm -hmm. or too short yeah like open too much or close too much yeah so his vdo has been altered mm -hmm. right so your vertical dimension of occlusion basically so there's a normal height that your jaws are usually used to yeah and so when they did this um maybe they made your teeth too long with the prosthesis, the, the fake gums and teeth, maybe it was too long or too short is what Dr. Yeah. Cruz saying. So because of that, your jaw can be, end up being reactive. And they say 80% of the population clenches or grinds. I, I clench, you know, you clench, you said when you work out, yeah. I, I clench all day doing all on four surgeries. It's no <laughs> joke, right? You think I'm joking, but we do, right? So it's like, we're like doing this like for like four hours, right? Um, but, you know, those could, you know, my recommendation to you, um, go see a prosthodontist for a second opinion. I think um, they should take a look at your all on four prosthesis, your bite, and maybe they can help you out. So mm -hmm. I, th I think one thing that people need to understand is a lot of people think that you, when we're doing an all on four, we're just placing implants, we're just slapping teeth in your mouth. Uh, it couldn't be further from the truth. Like getting a all on four with your, like, we're trying to blend your, your bite, your speech, your aesthetics. Let's just talk about aesthetics. When you're getting aesthetics, it's not just about like when you smile, how white your teeth are or the shape of your teeth or what your gums look like. It's also, you know, basically how positioned out they are too, yeah. right? 
bodily movement of the teeth or tipping or whatever, because then that offers lip support. Because our female patients all want big plump lips, right? And so you can achieve some of that by positioning your your you know your teeth out a little bit further or whatever, right? But then that starts affecting your speech, right? Because you're you know some of the like things that we say like the fricatives, what we say F or V, right? F F V V. If you think about it, the edge of our upper tooth contacting where on our lower lip is going to impact how we say things, right? Or our S or T sound, right? Those are all different things that are going to be affected by how your tooth is positioned, yeah. right? So I tell people in consults all the time, it's like dealing with a Rubik's Cube. You get your speech right, yeah. and then now you, it's like you get all the reds lined up, and then you're trying to get another color on the other side, and now you're messing up the side you just fixed, right? So balancing your speech, aesthetics, and your bites. functioning, your bite is yeah. complicated, yeah. right? And people are usually not coming in with great bites, from the beginning, yeah. right? They have periodontal teeth where the teeth, have, periodontal disease where the teeth moved, or they have like a class three underbite or an overbite, or overbite, over, like over over jet also, right? How deep your bite is also. There's, yeah. there's so many factors that come into play that patients need to understand. And again, you know, be selective of who you go to for your all on four. Because if you have some of these concerns, how good is your dentist going to be? You know, I don't rely, like, we don't rely on ourselves. Like, you know, that's why we have our, you know, prosthodontists here. Yeah, a lot of all on four. What I'm seeing is that a lot of all on four patients, you know, they have been missing teeth for a while. So they don't quite have a stable bite. Yep. Sometimes their jaw just go, goes all over the place. Like that. Yeah. They, like, so, they yeah. They don't remember what they're. They don't like remember. Their, yeah. And they ground down their teeth over yeah. time or their teeth are all splayed out from periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. And like, so finding that ideal bite is just, it's, it's a, it's a task. Mm -hmm. It's a task. So, and if you don't do it right, you can end up with circumstances like this. Right. So again, when you're searching for all on four, just don't look for somebody on Google that says that they do all on four. You know, I think it's always nice to have a good prosthodontist at your practice. Absolutely. All right. So Melanie Rome says after the final set of all on four, will there still be a gap or is a piece molded to the gum? So there isn't a gap. Great question. So. This is where I like to kind of like bash people who deliver all on four in a week, uh, the same week of the <laughs> surgery. Um, your bone and gum is going to shrink so much over the you know the next you know several months. Um, we wait five months here. Um, I see other centers out there like um, like even they say like they, they head into finals like even after three months. I in my mouth I'm going to wait. You know. Yeah, I think that's a little bit premature. Yeah. In my opinion, probably yours too. Yeah, I I want I want it done right. In the end, that's all I care about, right? So I know there's like always a big focus to trying to get done as fast as possible and telling patients what they want to hear. But trust us, we do these like every day of the week. We see so many all on four cases. We have literally so many patients in different phases of all on four, whether surgery day, exam, post-ops, you know, try-ins, final deliveries. Like we had, like literally our office is like all on four patients going through all like all day, right? And so we see every step of the process. We see what can go wrong. Every step of our protocol is based off of like risk mitigation, right? And sometimes, you know, in order for you to have a great result in the end, we have to tell you something that you don't want to hear. And that means waiting five months before you start going to your final eval. I mean, yeah, before your final impressions and stuff. So um, no, there won't be a gap because we waited that period of time, right? Yeah. Um, now, again, over years of time, could your bony gum can still continue to shrink where you don't have the implants? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to be really anal about things, then like what we were talking about, you could put like, you know, bio loss, like bovine bone graft in those extraction sockets. And that's me personally what I would do because I'm really paranoid about things and I like to over-engineer. Um, and you mentioned that also, right? If yeah. you did that in your mouth, like we would graft all our sockets, but not with just normal, even human bone. Well, I would, yeah. Bovine bone is going to be the best because it's it's it has the least remodeling, so you want that bone to stick around. So, yeah, um, yeah. So there won't be a gap to answer your question. Uh, let's see. Chip Mueller says, Muleman says, don't let anyone fool you. There will be pain. There will be a lot of bleeding. There will be swelling until your head feels like it'll pop. It's like a nine and a half hour process. Just when you think that you are safe and done, they will bring you to a room to mount the temporary implants for after surgery. Lots of Novocaine shots, a lot of them in the roof of your mouth and those freaking hurt. A day after I looked like I went 12 rounds with my dice and I couldn't go anywhere. If you have options, take them. It was a last resort for me, but knowing what uh, I know now, 
I just as soon have no teeth. Absolutely the worst thing I have ever had done. Okay, so I literally was telling a console for all on four literally a few hours ago. He was like, will this hurt, right? So during the procedure, you're sleeping. You're not gonna remember anything. Okay, so let's talk about post-operative pain, right? So I tell people this when we're talking about pain. Everything has averages, law of averages. So we got your normal bell-shaped distribution curve. I'm taking you back to college. But most people, let's say 80%, are going to be under this bell-shaped distribution curve. Okay. Then we're going to have our outliers. We're going to have 10% on either edge. Okay. 10% says the guy took like ibuprofen for one night and he was fine. The other guy on the other edge says is going to give you an answer like this. Right now, is this just that he has a low pain tolerance? Probably. Could be, but there's also another aspect of who was your surgeon? How aggressive was your bone reduction? Well, this is one of my main points. Like, I think that there is unnecessary overdone bone reduction, right? And if that's the case, then you're going to have more trauma, more swelling, more discomfort, right? And it's, uh, quite, it's unclear how long ago the surgery was done. This is a, he says it was a nine and a half hour surgery. And it looks like he's saying that yeah. he got uh, delivery the next day. Yeah. So no offense, but like, I, I find like an average time, I like to like average time for all on four upper and lower is like three hours, right? Taking your time, doing it right. Maybe three and a half hours. Every case is different. How big are your sinuses? You're doing four implants, six implants. But let's say on average three hours to three and a half hours. So again, no offense. Somebody, you go to somebody for a nine and a half hour surgery, which I've seen. I've heard of stories, right? I heard of uh, this lab tech and he said that this guy across the parking lot, this was years ago, did an all on four surgery and they were there till midnight. Oh, right, wow. doing the surgery. Oh, so patients can be facing a huge trauma and you know, you want to get do your research, go to someone that does this a lot. That's all I can say. Anything else you can add? Yeah, like I said, uh, it's unclear when the surgery was done. So if it's only been a day or two, yeah, I mean, what he's experiencing could be quite normal, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, but my experience, you know, yeah, sometimes I have patients that text me every day after a surgery mm -hmm. for about two weeks and then they stop texting me mm -hmm. because the pain's finally gone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I was to predict, because we typically give ibuprofen and hydrocodone as pain management protocols afterwards, patients are typically taking um, ibuprofen for a week or two, right? I'd say expect to go two weeks. I like to under promise over you, whatever. I never want to say you're not going to have pain because then I'm going to be a liar. Yeah, there, and then there will piss. be pain. Right. We're taking exactly. out, you know, when we're doing this, we're taking out all the teeth and, right. you know, work, you know, messing with even, the bone. Even if you have one tooth taken out, you're going to have ibuprofen for a few days, right? So like... We're not going to tell you you're not going to have pain because you, if I'm you, I'd be pissed because like we're setting expectations and we're yeah, lying, false right? False promises. Yeah, false promises. So um, I tell you that, you know, expect maybe to take ibuprofen for two weeks, maybe even longer. Yeah. But I'd say especially earlier on, some people like will have to supplement with the hydrocodone, right? Mm -hmm. You might be taking a hydrocodone every six hours. You might not. You might only be taking it at nighttime. Everybody's different, you know? Swelling has an impact. The more swelling you have, the more pain you also feel too. That's why I like to give a medrol, like, you know, and have them start that a day before the procedure. Or providers can also give steroids through the IV. I prefer to give medrol. I personally, after my career doing all the guided bone regenerations and massive procedures that cause like the like crazy swelling, I've seen medrols work better versus me giving dexamethasone through the IV before the surgery. Um, again, that's personally what I've seen. Um, I see less bruising and swelling that way. Therefore, you can see less you know, pain. So, um, but everybody's got different, like, you know, pain responses. Don't necessarily only listen to the guy that has this type of experience. And then also don't listen to the guy that has said he took one ibuprofen after the surgery and expect that's going to happen to you. Yeah. You everyone's know? experience will be different. Yep. And one other thing I want to tell you is, um, ask the, uh, the guy that's doing, uh, you know, your surgery, you know, at the consultation, how long, like how, how much bone, you know, reduction do you expect? How do, how do you think it's going to be removing my teeth? These are some questions you can ask, you know? Um, who was asking me earlier? But somebody was um, telling me, like, I had a, we had uh, multiple consultations today, but I don't know if you recall that patient. They said that, like, it took them, like, two and a half hours to just extract the teeth. Yeah, I, I don't know. But if you're seeing somebody, no offense, but if you're, you're seeing somebody that's taking two and a half hours. Or for one jaw, I think. That's insane. Yeah. Like, you, like, it does not take that long. It takes you know, less than half an hour to extract all your teeth, right? So the longer your, uh, your procedure is, because you're seeing somebody that's not as, you know, well 
versed in taking out teeth and is not as proficient and fast at it, that gives you more time for the numbness to wear off, right? More injections, more trauma. So these are things to consider, right? Um, let's see here. Bone density. So Strong Spear says bone density. You're telling everyone that you can't really tell if a patient has sufficient implant bone density until you start using your little ratchet after you've already drilled a hole into the patient's jaw. Why would anyone go through a procedure of having all teeth removed and drilling implant holes into the jaw if there is bone density uncertainty that could make the procedure a failure if the ratchet numbers aren't good enough? So what are your thoughts on this? I mean, yeah, some many times we have a pretty good idea as to what the bone density is going to be like. But then, you know, there's sometimes situations that we have, you know, we didn't expect. So we can, when you have your CBCT done, yeah. we can actually see what your bone yeah. density is. Yeah. yeah. Like we just by like, because like on those x-rays, those 3D scans or any x-ray, the more dense something is, the whiter it is, right? Yeah. So the more white you have in your bone, in the middle part, the medullary part of the bone, the cancellous bone, then the better density you have, right? So that, that's what we like to see. Um, so we have a good idea. And then also like the CBCT software, the 3D scan software also has like a heat map and kind of shows you like, oh, this is like denser bone. Yeah. Now there's going to be obviously patients that, you know, who are the patients that have like not as good bone density or like sometimes patients who had like um, gastric bypass um, surgeries because they can't absorb minerals and nutrients as much. So they have less bone density. Postmenopausal women sometimes. Yep. So elderly white females or elderly females, sometimes their bone can be like paper mache. Yeah. Like literally you can push your drill. You don't have to power up your drill. Yeah. Some people call it butter bone. Yeah, butter bone, right? It's like <laughs> like butter, man. Because yeah. it also there's like adipose, like fat in yeah. there. And it looks like it's just like butter, right? And so like you just literally push the drill through with your hand, right? You don't have to power the drill. So um, main point of this is that we can actually tell based off of your 3D scan to give us a general idea. Now, what we tell patients, and like I think there may be a little misunderstanding by Strong Spear. So he's saying, so the procedure is going to be a total failure. So you're going to take out all my teeth place the implants, and then tell me that the all-on-4 is not going to work. No, we're not saying that, right? So here's the good news. Even these patients that are butter bone, right? If their bone is super soft, what we do is we'll have to just place those implants and we're just going to have to let nature take its course and heal for about four months at least, okay? We'll let that bone heal. And once the bone has fused with that implant, just like a normal bone that's setting from a bro being broken, it just needs time to heal. At that point, your implants are going to be nice and solid. Now, would we still prefer higher density? Yes, absolutely. So that patient that has butter bone should get more implants than just four. Because that force, when they're biting down, you want them to distribute those forces on more implants. The more implants you have, the less force per implant, meaning the less opportunity for the implant to fail. So that's what we're saying. Now, if that patient, when we're placing those implants and those implants go in with a certain torque value, right? Now, that's another conversation. They say composite torque. You know, yeah. 120 newtons, or are we talking about, you know, like at least like me personally, I'd say like at least 35 newtons per implant. Um, so everybody, like I think 30 is a little too light, in my opinion, so too. right? So um, if you have enough torque, then you can actually put your teeth on the same day. That's basically what we're talking about, right? So because the problem is that if you don't have enough torque, you're wearing a denture. And if you're telling a patient that they're going to have to wear a denture, for four months when they came in and they're expecting to go home with teeth in that day, it's disappointing for the patient, right? So we want just to be like very like upfront with patients. And we see a lot of, we see like, you know, I mean, with as many all on four, like when you're doing like 40, 50 arches per month, you're going to see some patients that have really soft bone. Yeah. Very minority of the time, but you will see patients like that. So they will have to wear dentures. So we see patients like this. And they still have been like, you know, then they later on get their screw and teeth, right? And then they later on get their zirconia. And they've been wearing that for years and they have no issues, you know? So the good news is all hope is not lost if your bone is soft. You just won't be going home with teeth that day, yeah. right? You'll go, I mean, you'll go home with the denture. So you'll have teeth. They're just not screwed in teeth, yeah. right? And, you know, one time I had a patient, I was so certain that she would go home with denture because based on what we saw in the CBCT scan, the bone density wasn't ideal but i was able to give her fixed teeth with their um, supported by five implants right now i also want to bring up another important thing that if you're like a tweener patient and if you have to go home with a denture we want the best outcome for you right 
So we're not a big corporation and we're not just independent contractors here, just, you know, you know, just doing random stuff and hey, we're out of here in a year and then like don't have to worry about it anymore. Like we warranty our product. So if you have a bad result, we're going to have to see you to fix your, you know, your, your implants. Where are we going to place your implants? As we discussed earlier in this video, like finding different places to place your implants. We're trying, we don't randomly just place your implants and like wherever we want to place them. We have to spread your implants to get anterior posterior spread to avoid cantilevers. So we are picking specific locations. And if we don't have the positions available, then we have to go to more exotic locations like zygomatic implants, pterygoid implants, sinus lifting. These are all more invasive, more difficult procedures. So the outcome becomes a lot more difficult. Like, you know, so we want the best outcome for you. We do not want to send anybody home in a denture on surgery day. We want you, we want predictability because if you have failed implants, you know, patients don't understand what a catastrophe it can become, you know? So that, you know, just to give you a little context of what, what's going through our head. Um, Steve's turkey teeth journey. Is it easier to clean on all on four with a water flosser than three on six, as I'm guessing it would be a tighter fit. P.S. I have all on five. I find cleaning easy. I think they're both pretty simple, you know, but here's the thing that I'll say is if you go to somebody that's not um, as predictable with their prosthesis for an all on four, if you get a more of a concave prosthesis and just not hygienic, then it's going to be more difficult to clean. Yeah. Right. So um, again, just be careful who you go to. Um, let's see here. Luis says, I wish you guys were located in New Jersey. I don't. <laughs> too cold, my friend. Uh, too cold. Um, someone says, I am listening to this video and I'm wishing I would be treated from you because I have implants fail issues twice now. I am not believing my family orthodontist surgeon, maybe oral surgeon. Thank you so much for your explanation. I'm following up with my dentist again. As a senior, I can't go travel for my dental issues. I hope I want to watching your new videos. Okay. Well, hopefully you're watching this video, Jasmine. Um, what are your thoughts kind of like, let's talk about dental implant failure. Right, like, what are you, like, your most common reasons for dental implant failure? Um, maybe placing implants that are too this, fat. This is early yeah. implant failure. Oh, early. Really? Yeah, I, I I totally agree with where you're going. Yeah. Like, too wide of an implant yeah. for the bone is definitely going to be like longer term an issue. Yeah, so you'll see more failures later on down the road. So that's that's a huge important thing that a lot of the dental community doesn't know enough about. But let's talk about short early implant failure. What are your thoughts? I don't think this person is talking about all on four either. They're just talking yeah. about like single implants or something like that. Mm -hmm. While you read that, my <laughs> personal thoughts are, um, I think like in this video, let's talk about failed root canals. Yeah, like I've oh, seen right. failed root canals that just are so infected. And even when you go in and you clean it out really well, um, it's just, man, that it just like, it takes so much longer for that bone to just remodel itself and be healthy bone again. Mm. You know, I find uh, typically... My sweet spot, I've done 10, I don't know how many extraction and bone grafts I've done in my career. Like tens of thousands of them in you know 14 years. Um, and I find that the bone is the best by waiting at least four months. If you go too soon, somebody like, somebody like uh, was telling me recently during a consultation that they went in like only after three months or they were, yeah. And it was like too soon in my opinion, but Anyways, um, yeah, like some people say three months. I find the, the at the three month mark, the bone is still too granular. It hasn't completely remodeled. Yeah. And if the bone hasn't completely remodeled, it's not solid bone that you're working with. So you're not having a good foundation for your implant. So that's definitely not ideal. I would wait at least four months. Now when we're talking about infected root canals. We usually do. We usually wait six months. Yeah, like six months, you know, from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Because it just takes longer. That, like... This is why I hate root canal sometimes. Like that bone is so infected and patients don't even know because they don't have a nerve there. They, they don't know anything's going wrong. That bone is so infected. And so it just, that, that's the state of the, 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 like the, like, you know, the bone it, with it being so infected, it just takes so long, sometimes six, seven months for it to recover for you to place an implant in there predictably. Yeah. I've seen implants fail on infected root canal sites. I, I saw research that came out earlier. Um, I was watching an AAP lecture, Perio, you know, our um, Academy of Perio. I was watching a lecture and they were talking about research and they were citing research that said, oh, like infected root canals and immediate implants can be placed as predictably 
in that socket as a, a normal tooth. And I was like, I don't agree with that, you know? And, you know, maybe people have different disinfecting protocols. Some people use like chlorhexidine, some people use peroxide, um, but those can help, you know, now there's downsides to both of those products too. And people will tell you that, but I mean, if it's my, if I had, I don't have a root canal in my mouth, but if I did, then I would, I would want an antiseptic, you know, used, but um, what are your thoughts about this? I think infected root canals are a big potential reason. Yeah, I think so. And yeah. early implant placement too soon, maybe yeah. immediate implants. I think people tend to do uh, overdo immediate implants. Yeah, that's a big thing nowadays. In my mouth, I mean, if it's a front tooth and you really know what you're doing, then yeah, do an immediate implant on me. Um, as long as the bone is really good. Um, otherwise, I prefer staged. I like more predictable. Um, if it's a molar, I mean, if, if it's a premolar and the nerve is far away or like, you know, we could do an immediate on that. But if we're dealing with a molar and it's close to the nerve, why risk it? You yeah. Know? I mean, if I had to get an implant, I would take the stage approach yeah. instead of doing the immediate. Yeah. So again, I mean, just, we're just trying to give patients like a predictable, you know, option. So to each their own, patients will always ask what's best for them. But, you know, we uh, always, you know, try to tell you the pros and cons of our solution and let you guys choose. All right. Uh, dental specialist one who's clearly a dentist says, why stress about stability four and 13? So he's talking about my posterior implants on this, just the surgery, zygo. just go zygo, no pterygoid needed. I totally disagree with, I mean, this is very subjective. Dentistry yeah. is very subjective. He's saying just go to a zygomatic implant, right? I think that patient is in her forties or like younger fifties. Like, I think she's in her 40s, like upper 40s. So, I mean, what are your thoughts about just going to a Zygo? Well, you know, the Zygo is a good option, but at the same time, there are some potential complications that you may have to deal with. Later Let, on. Let's talk about what a Zygo is, even because I don't think most people even know, like zygomatic implants, right? So these are essentially uh, implants that go through the cheekbone like right. right here. Right. So in your mouth, and you remember this case because you're the one that actually filmed yeah. it, right? <laughs> Would you have done a zygo on that patient? Um, I don't think it was really necessary for her. So yeah. Maybe some people definitely need zygo. Yeah. So yeah. we probably do a zygo on a patient like, you know, once a week or every other week. Yeah. Right. So you just need it sometimes. I did one on a patient yesterday. So, um, but the problem is that like we, we like to preserve zygos as a back, back pocket option, like a last resort. Yeah. Right. There can be complications with that. Yeah, you can have you can sinus issues. Skin abscess. Yeah, like a uh, cutaneous yeah. fistula. You can yeah. have like uh, sinus issues. Now we never see those, but they happen. They yeah. can happen, right? So it's always a potential risk, right? So, like when I like you know this surgery was done like what like back in like January or something like that. Yeah. So um, I um, yeah I've seen some patients come in for consultations like for second opinions and stuff that were told that they needed zygos and I completely disagree with like some of those treatment plans. And zygomatic implants can fail too. Absolutely. And what happens if it does? We, we know some providers that do a lot of zygo implants and they admitted that zygomatic implants sometimes fail. But so, like, what did they like? Even Dr. Gonzalez like, what does he say? Like a good zygo is like the one that you don't place. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, I mean, like explore all your options and just yeah. because you can do a zygo because they got big fat zygos doesn't mean that we should do a zygo, you know? So, but you know, in that case, like we just opted for a pterygoid. There's downsides of pterygoids too, because it extends a little further back. Some people don't like that, yeah. but some people would actually rather you do that versus going to a zygo, yeah. right? Just due to the potential complications and stuff. So yeah, that patient had a great result, but I mean, God forbid she ever had posterior implant failures, then yeah, you're right. Zygo would be another great option, Yeah. right? We had a patient that came in from Colorado, um, literally for a consultation a few hours ago. She had multiple failed implants. Um, she had a fractured implant even. She has uh, issues with her front bridge. Um, so we had a conversation with her and we said, okay, here are your options. Um, you can do, um, looks like a Zygo, like a posterior zygo on the right side with some pterygoids, you know, maybe six to eight implants. Um, she was like, could you please do like a, a sinus lift? So we were like, yeah, I mean, we could do a sinus lift. I think things are getting more complicated that way. You know, we do tons of sinus lifting here also, but she's right. I mean, it's an option. She wanted that option. And so we were like, okay, cool. And I told her, 
you know, that's probably not the option that I would go with first. You have awesome, she had awesome zygos, right? Big back cheekbones. So we thought that the, her zygo would be a great option for her. Um, very predictable, you know, obviously there is, you know, risk associated with any procedure, but she opted to want to be like, and we told her, hey, like, we could do the science lift. God forbid you ever have any issues with that, or we feel like you know, that's not going to be the best option for you. Then we're going to have to pivot and go to the zygo. And she was totally cool with it. Yeah, she was totally okay with starting with the denture. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's what surprised me. Well, yeah, I told her because she literally has no bone yeah. on her right side from like this big span of an area. And I said like you, we would just be reconstructing so much of your sinus with you know with bone that there's no way that you could go home with screwed in teeth that day because you know it just wouldn't be happening most likely. I said, you're going to have to wear a denture if you want to do the sinus lifting option. Yeah. If you want zygos, then we have to, you know, you could go home with screwed in teeth. Mm -hmm. And she was fine with that. She actually preferred that option wearing a denture, right? that actually which I was surprised. Me. Yeah, I was surprised too, right? Because I, I would think that most people are disappointed. And she's yeah. like, no, that's what I totally expected. So she came from Colorado. She actually had seen multiple people um, for consultations and they all told her about sinus lifting and she was never even told about zygo yeah. right so but yeah zygo was an option for her zygomatic implants which was funny also because we had an hour before her um, the other patient from Houston who is going to um, the UK in a month and we told her that like if she wanted to go home with screwed in teeth she might have to get zygo, yeah. right? And so she was like, yeah. I need screwed in teeth because yeah. she hasn't been back to the UK since pre-COVID, right? So she's gonna see all her friends and family again. So she's probably wanting to impress them. Yeah. And she doesn't wanna to talk to them and her denture potentially falling out of her mouth, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, if you want predictability in her case, that's why I was telling her, hey, you might have to do zygo, but then maybe not. So let's see. Someone said, what about rice, sir, after eating, um, after getting your wisdom <laughs> teeth extracted? And he says, I am Indian. It's not a racist joke. <laughs> Man, you can always eat rice after any dental procedure, right? So someone said, um, you know, SK13 Fiverr says, FP1, most probably people are probably not a good candidate because uh, for FP1 because of the amount of gum tissue they show when smiling. Yeah, absolutely. Lip line is super important. Um, you are so informative. Thank you. God bless you always. Thank you, Marie. Um, she said, hi, doctors. Do you only screw in the all on fours or all on six or can they be cemented in? They can only be screwed in. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's wait. I mean, well, people could make a cement. Wait, is there even a possible way to do a single arch yeah. cemented in? Well, not the uh, well, the framework has to be screwed in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then cement it on top. Yeah, cement yeah. It, yeah. But yeah, like nowadays though, nobody, yeah, like you shouldn't have to do that. But wait, if they're doing FP1, right? That's what they, like, I don't even no, know. No, it's screwed in. Oh, FP1. is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But would there be, there could be cement retained, like FP1, right? I've never seen I never do. Like only the one, the, the ones I've seen are mostly screw retained. At okay. least the ones that they show on Instagram. Uh, all right you see what dr ku is doing most of the time He's like, <laughs> all right my friends i think uh we actually uh, like uh, this this video is actually now starting to borderline what we had a roundtable discussion about two weeks ago so um yeah i mean if you guys like have any questions out there we'll answer them we'll just have like an hour-long session um i know a lot of you guys like to do your research so maybe you could just play like videos like this and just play it in the car while you're driving to work or whatever yeah. just I, I tend to listen to YouTube all day, even when I'm doing chores at home. So even when you do surgery, yeah, <laughs> all day, no joke, right? <laughs> I'm like doing surgery, and I like have podcasts like playing all day. Yeah. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel to free to leave those comments or questions in the comments, and we will get back to them in videos like this. All right, thanks. We'll see you next time.